Here we go. Let's get this thing started. Mike's going to do his fourth and final. Yes, sir. Fourth and final. Fourth and final electronics. Uh, this series, for those of you that have been here for it, has been phenomenal for him. Kudos to him for doing a great job. Uh, tonight we're also going to have Justin Crawford. I'm going to be in the middle. Uh, you guys asked for it last time. I asked for a fall transition discussion. So I'm going to go over the, the migration, the initial stages of the migration that we're in now and how to stay on those fish throughout fall as they move in and out of these creeks. Uh, and I'm not sure what Justin's going over. I haven't got to discuss that with him, but he'll be here in a little bit. He's going to be our third speaker tonight. And uh, ask any questions at any time. We appreciate y'all being here as always. Um, at the end, we're all going to, all three of us will get up here. And, and any questions that you have, you can bounce it off all of us and get an answer from all three of us. So it's kind of an open forum type deal. You guys, most of y'all have been here before. Y'all know how it works. If, if you haven't, if it's your first time, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you coming. We hope you continue to come and, and follow, follow along <coughs> on the internet when you can't be here in yes, person please. and uh, other than that mike tell them about some electronics buddy. all right guys were you ready for this one so uh, before i go into number four okay we are just really quick we're going to refresh because at the end of this i've got an announcement to make and i think some of you guys are going to join but we started seminar one 30 minute seminar about the sonar part Okay, everybody wanted to know what's a big bass look like on the sonar. That's what a big bass should look like on a sonar. Everybody in the class, most of you got to see this before. I'm not going to go back into the sonar seminar. We'll talk about that at the end. I'm just doing a refresh. Second seminar was about down scan imaging. We talked about a lot of things that that's used for. Everybody wanted to know what big fish look like on down scan. That's what big fish look like on the down scan. Okay? You're more than welcome, those of you, I know some of you have seen this in class, you're more than welcome to look at it at the end. This is a quick refresh, guys. Seminar three. Seminar three was side scanning. Okay? Side scanning, self-explanatory. We talked about the structures and the views and the things. But again, everybody wanted to know, what's a big fish look like on side scan? That's what big fish look like on side scan. Okay? So in those first three seminars, we have covered the sonar, the down scan, and the side scan. That's everything that you use to go find your fish. Those are your binoculars. A deer hunter will not go in the field without binoculars. You need to know how to use your sonar with your underwater eyes. Okay? Now we're going to go into what I think is the most overlooked part of these units. We tend to spend as much as $3,000 for an HDS Lawrence unit or a Hummingbird unit. And yet we have all of these capabilities. We're going to talk about three, maybe four, really three capabilities and some accessory things that are very much available and should be used by you guys. Okay? If you own one of these units, you're missing out by not doing this. So the first part of number four is in one calling seminar for a, a uh, uh, tips, tricks, you could call it advanced sonar stuff. Okay. And the first thing we're going to talk about is how many people know how to make a waypoint. Okay, y'all do. That's pretty easy, right? How many of you guys have trouble? How many on the Facebookers know how to make a waypoint? If you don't, please ask. We can talk about it. It's pretty easy. There's just a button to push when you're ready. How many viewers, please ask or answer this. I'd like to know. How many in the class feel comfortable after you've made that waypoint to turn around and actually find it and make sure your bait hit it? You feel good about that, okay? I'm going to give you some tricks and usage of your mapping that will help you identify exactly where that is, okay? I'm going to send this first one around. I want the class to see this because I got a drawing of it. So you're going to see the map and you're going to see range rings, okay? That has to be set. Your map doesn't just come up that way. You have to go in to your settings and uh, put the range rings on. You also want to take, if you'll notice, the black line in the middle off the cursor, which is your boat. That's your look ahead. Okay? So you have your look ahead turned on and you have your range rings turned on. And in essence, the right side here, the left is for the next part. The right side here is what I just described. Okay, let me do this for the camera real quick. I have the range rings, I have the black mark in the middle, that's the boat cursor, and I have that black look ahead line. Okay? Now, the blue part is registering a waypoint. Okay? So, everybody agree that the boat's in line, we're heading to the waypoint. Anybody want to give me an answer? Uh, an answer? Take a look at this. You should be able to tell me how far away is that waypoint from the front of my boat. Anybody have any ideas? 100 feet. 
100 feet. 1,000. I want you guys to all look down in this bottom corner right here, okay? When you zoom in and out on your graph, this will yeah. change, okay? This bottom little measure, okay, the little two bars, it will change as you zoom in and out. You need to pay attentive to this change, okay? You'll see this little number right here in the bottom. Right now I have it at 50, okay? What that measure is measuring is each one of these distances, okay? Typically the circle above will tell you it's maximum, 250. So if I have 50 feet from here, here, and so on, okay? Here's the waypoint. That means this waypoint right now is driven at 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, which is the outside of my range ring. This measure right here allows me to know how close when I'm pulling up on that. So let me just see if everybody got that. I hold this up high here. Boat cursor here, I go 50, 100, 150, 200, 250. That's my waypoint, and I'm set at 50, 250. Okay? That's how you do that. All right? So in other words, it should be simple math for everybody. If I move it into there, how close is it? 100. 100. So if I was pulling in on this without changing my zoom, okay, if I was pulling on that wet point, when would I be when would it be 50 feet in front of me and when would I want to fire? When that blue dot gets right on that first circle. So this is a measuring formulation right here. When you zoom in and out, pay attention to it. You'll always have five range rings. That breaks it down so you can understand your distance. Okay? That'll help you find your waypoints, okay? The next part of this seminar, did everybody get that? If you didn't, please put a question on there so I can make sure that you understood how simple that was. Um, when you say it'll help you find a waypoint, you can drive right to the waypoint. So correct. This, this is telling you how far off of it. It's telling you how far. So in other words, say that I found an oak tree, I made the waypoint, and I want to ease up to it. When do I cast? You know, 40 yards, 30 yards, 50. How close do I want to get? This is my measure. That's how I measure it. All right? You can also change and they'll have some breakdown of your look ahead, which will help you. Um, I run the range rings all the time because this is the next phase. Did everybody grab that? Seemed like everybody got that pretty cool. Okay? So you already need waypoints. We didn't give you a whole lot of material there. We just kind of tightened up. This is the ship that I'm driving tonight. How many of you are scared of Lake Fork? Because of the navigation. Or any East Texas lake. <laughs> How many of you are scared of navigating on any East Texas lake because of the wood? Because you have to follow trails. All right? You have to follow. If there's not buoys, you're following trails. Okay, this is where these range rings are your best friend. Okay? So over here, again, I have the range rings. I have the boat cursor and the look ahead. The red lines simulating a trail that I'm supposed to follow, okay? So if you look closely over here, as I said, black in the middle is the cursor, black line is the look ahead, the red is the trail that I want to follow, okay? Now, what I do is I split screen my sonar. I put my mapping exclusively on one side because this side has to be zoomed down all the way. This makes for 25 which makes for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, okay? Which means I have a 10-foot diameter in that center circle. Does everybody get that? Okay? So again, if I've zoomed it down, these range rings now go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, which means I have a 10-foot diameter in the center. My boat is 8 foot wide, about 90 inches, 92 inches, 7 and a half, 8 foot wide. When I run this trail, I'm looking ahead on the navigating map so I can kind of know what's coming. And this is two, three hundred yards ahead that I'm looking ahead. But on this side, when I'm running, as long as that red trail is in my center circle as I've drawn it here, I'm about as tight on that line as I can be. Y'all understand he's talking about running dual maps on your... Running dual maps. maps. Right. You have to run dual maps because this will only function this tight. This is what tightened me up, using my range rings. Are we, is everybody with me on that? Using the range rings is what tightened me on my line. So when I'm running, I tell my clients sometimes that some of these don't bother me right now. I've got to keep the red line in the middle. So I'm running. I'm looking ahead to know where I'm going. But as long as that red line stays in that very, very center circle, 
I'm on my line with, within some variance. Okay, remember it, 10 foot diameter. So that's as safe as you're gonna be able to run it. If the line's running right through the middle, then you're right dead smack on it. Dead smack on it. You're zoomed all the way in. So I hope you guys got some of that. This is advanced training, okay? That's how I run places that are spooky. That's how I've made my own trail. I've gone and put hazard marks, tons of black hazard marks, and I run and zigzag through them because I've pretty much given myself very much confidence to run that red line, okay? I don't want you guys to all just go out there and go try this on the red off lines or off the... I want you to learn how to do this in the buoy lanes, okay? The map, the chip comes with the line. You're going to have a black line to follow when you run from buoy to buoy. Get this going. And when you start saying, hey, man, we ran in buoys tight. I felt cool about that. Then you can say, all right, maybe we carefully venture off into some of these guide lanes. Maybe we make ourselves a shortcut going across here. That's still on you for navigating. You can make a mistake. But this here, once it's done right, I can promise you it took all the ease out. It took off my shoulders. I run whatever I want now doing this. All right? One last thing before I talk about this is you can turn your sonar on. The most important thing that you can do if you're going to use your sonar for navigating is do not turn it on and walk away and do other things in your boat. Watch what it happens when it boots up. It will first tell you the strength of the signal. For some reason you get sidetracked, you get, you get bothered by somebody, you forget that. You can go into the unit and check its satellite strength. There are some places where it will boot off from the start and you're off from the start that you think you're on. So it's very important. That's why they put in there, do not use for navigation purposes. They don't want to be sued by it, but it's capable of it. If you have strong signals, it's just like flying an airplane under the hood. Okay, the pilot doesn't see where he's going. He's running here. So, all right. That's the most advanced that I can get on that part for you guys. Without this, my favorite part of tonight. Um, did everybody enjoy the last three seminars? I know tonight was, was I'm already about 20 minutes in. Um, but I have an announcement to make. Um, I got my new skeeter coming Tuesday, so I'm back in business. I'm available for the guide trips again. Excited, Skeeter FX21. I got a bay boat coming. I'm going to doctor this bay boat up, and for the first time, I'm now available for the sonar classes. This four sonar classes is about two hours worth of time. Now I'm going to offer it for sale. Private message me for details. But either in your own boat, which includes the setup on your gear, make sure your gear's doing right, and it doesn't matter whether it's Hummingbird or Lorenz, or out with me. But you can take this four-step class on the water, and I promise you, when you private message me for the price, you're gonna say, man, I'm doing that. Because I don't wanna just take your money. I wanna teach you this stuff. I want you to see it on the water. So if you have sonar trouble, if you wanna set your stuff, if you need your stuff set, you want to learn about it on the water, McFarlandFishing.com is now offering the sonar class on the water. Okay? So, I thank you for that part. Now let's just talk about some fishing. I'm looking forward to the fall. Uh, this guy's really got stuff dialed in for this fall. These fish are already in the places, and there's so many coming to those fall patterns that you're going to get a lot out of this. Um, any questions about what I talk? Anybody? Yeah, one question. How far are those buoys drift? Quite a bit. There's, if you're in the buoys on Fork, there's a lot of grace. I'm going to tell that lake gets about six or seven feet low. There's a lot of grace. There is some stumps in the buoy lines at about seven or eight foot low. Um, there's a few. But if you're in the buoys, don't worry. There's most of the places, that full pool especially, I mean, I stray all over those buoys. I mean, run them sometimes. I'm just I'm running next to them and over water. Yeah, and if you guys like us, I mean, there's, I think we spend probably just as much time running not looking at buoys as we do running yeah. from buoy to buoy. Uh, don't, threat, don't stress about the buoys. Um, if you're practicing this, you're going to notice that those buoys, good, it'll better answer this question, if you're practicing this from buoy to buoy, and occasionally you may see that the buoy gets in your way of the line that you're following, obviously don't run the buoy over, but <laughs> you're going to see some, you're going to see some discrepancies. You're going to be following that lane, and then you're going, the buoy's over there, do I follow the lane or the buoy? Do I follow the lane or the buoy? Follow the lane. It's a boat lane. That's where it's supposed to be. The boat probably got moved when you pushed it away. Um, but there's two things now I want to clarify before I do say off. There's what's called boat lanes and guide lanes. 
Does everybody know the difference? You must. A boat lane will have buoys. If it has buoys, you're probably pretty doggone safe. About 99.9, .9. if you stay buoy to buoy, you're having no trouble. The guide lanes are lanes that you'll see that you can drift off of those, on those chips. They go else places, and they have no buoys. All right, if you ain't good at doing this, you got no business running them guide lanes. None. You'll wreck yourself, you'll wreck your boat, you'll kill yourself or someone else. Okay. Especially as the water drops. As the water drops. I've got a spot right now that I love the water drops. I literally slim through two, keep three huge, huge oak trees. And every time I do it, my clients will go, oh, did you see that tree? And I play with them and I go, what tree? Did you see that one big oak tree on the left over by my side? And I say, really, how close was it? They say, two feet. So I go, wait a minute. We went by that thing that was that big around. We were that close to it, not that close. And he says, that close, sir. And I say, Great, because there was one on the other side, too. I'm running the deal. If I would have been, I would have hit the other one. So I threaded the needle right through. Okay? okay. Any questions, guys? You find the strongest signal when you're booting up your system and set up signal. The best thing to do is wait till you get to the open part of, of the ring. If you like pulling the fork and you happen to be in oak trees and all that stuff, don't turn yourself off. Well, actually, the, really the best thing to do is put the boat in the water, wait till you're idling out to the open water, Turn the graph on, let it boot up right there, because then you kind of got your, it's got your undivided attention. You're watching it. You don't got no other, nothing on your mind. You're waiting for it. You can't go nowhere. You're saying, come on, graph, boot. Come on, boot, boot, boot. You're looking at it. That's the best time to turn it on for that purpose. If you're navigating and you need it. All right? A couple more quick things. I'm going to end and talk about using this, right? Your gauges. We got gauges that you can get an MEA 200. It's about three, four hundred bucks. Your sonar can be set for so many things. Live well temperatures, cooler temperatures, fuel mileage, oil consumption. This is never used in Lorenz. I don't know a single guy that uses it. It should be used. This is better than your dash. It's better than any instruments that any basketball comes with from the floor. You can personalize your own tack and watch everything from water temperatures of your cooler, your live well, your engine, your consumption. Pass that around. You guys ought to look into doing that. You can know the engine combustion rate. You can know how hot your engine is so before you hammer down in the winter and la, la, la. Okay? Anybody familiar with this page? There's only one reason I printed this page. Okay, everybody should see this. When you come down to turn off your sonar, you worked hard. You've been out there all day long, and you have made 200 waypoints, and you even laid down a trail. The way that you should be turning the sonar off is by powering off here. When you first push the button in the bottom corner, if you push and hold it, it will power off. If you just push it once, this screen comes up on the Lowrance. On the Hummingbird, it's a push and hold. It tells you three seconds, and it closes itself out. On the Lowrance, they don't have that. So if you aren't pushing it once and then telling this screen to power off, you can lose all the homework that you saved for that day. It will not trust necessarily process. So when you power down, push your button once, go to the screen and tell it power off, and then it will process down. Okay, I also asked there's a stand button by there. If you have two units you've been running in your console, put on standby. Same thing, push the button once, choose standby, and now you're saving battery. These things drink batteries. They drink the batteries. You also eliminate having any feedback from front to set from your front graph, okay? So remember, this fourth seminar was just about some tricks and tips and things and other things that we do beyond looking for fish. How many guys have trouble? Did you get that part? No, okay. is, is that all the gens or just the most recent gen? They go one, all, two, three. All. Even number yep. one. Yep, even number one still one. has this up. It looks a little different, but it still has the same power on, power off, okay? okay. Um, so if that's the way you're gonna do that. This is the same screen that you'll add all of your overlays. So if you wanted to put your time and your water temperature and your speed, this is where you'll learn to do it. Again, I'll show you that on the water, and if you want more in your own boat, my boat doesn't matter, okay? So those are, it's about the end of what tricks and tips I'm gonna share. There's a lot more on the water. All right, you wanna come out and see some of them. Some of them are for finding fish inside heavy junk, how I tweak the graph or tweak the sonar or use other palettes, etc. So I planted a seed, 
guys really love you here. Um, it was kind of a difficult thing for me to get through first time I've ever done a big seminar, seminar like this. I want to end tonight on a bait, um, not necessarily a bait, but a, uh, an LFT lure or product, terminal tackle, that I came across this last week that I thought was really unique. Uh, Billy has opened my eyes up to the shallow water fishing phenomenally and the vegetation and stuff, and I got to pitching and flipping the vegetation. And um, I found this little cylinder, tungsten weight, that has a screw in. So it's a worm weight that screws to the head of your worm. And uh, it's tungsten. And I got the idea, I'm going to pass this around. And I'll tell you the coolest part about it. I got the idea to try this because I felt like this nice little tungsten weight would go in and out of the little alligator grass real well, it wouldn't catch anything. And um, I did think about probably the most important factor. It does go in and out. It's cylinder dry. It's shaped right for grass, for flipping. It's a flipping weight. But since the worm attaches to it as well, when I set the hook on the first fish, I had put a bead in front of it, and I shouldn't have. And Billy said, if you remove that bead, that whole thing will go flying up the line. How many have any idea how good it is, how cool it is to get the bait to go away from the hook when you got a big fish? That's why we do it with swim baits. They slide up the line. A line through swim bait runs up the line so the fish doesn't have the weight of the swim bait to dislodge. So this is the first flipping weight that I found that slides up the line when you set the hook. And most of the time it takes the bait with it. So you're not ruining your bait, you're not losing your bait. Um, if you're interested, check that out. This is made by LFT. It's half ounce, three quarter, and one ounce. It's a flipping weight. You can get them unpainted or not. Um, but I just found this week that in the vegetation, boy, having that little screw lock part on there, keeping the worm up and pull the worm down, things like that, was really neat. Okay. It does. The, the line, yep, it has a hole in it. Yes, sir. Yep. All right, let's pass that around there. Any questions? Man, thank you guys. Is there any questions on Facebook here? I got one for you. Back on the tracks, what's the variance on that? In other words, if you're running, say, at midnight, and I'm at home from a fireworks display, and you're running down the side of the lane, I was told there's at least a 10-foot variance on either side. So I've, told, I've been told 20. I've been told about actually even up to 20 yards. I mean, you really don't want to shoot through two trees that are five foot away because she could be on one of those trees. You're talking about, oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. The variance there isn't any as long as you make sure it boots upright. So in other words, if you're talking about that meaning the waypoint's not where it really is? Yeah. I mean, I thought when you did a track, that you had a little bit of variance that you weren't. You think you're driving down the center of it, but it could be five feet one side or the other. That's if, that's if you don't boot right. If okay. you don't watch the boot, that's right. Okay. If it'll come up, and it'll tell you what happened if it doesn't get a strong signal, when it, it'll flash a, a alarm, not necessarily a bell, but you see a little alarm signal in the bottom corner. It's telling you I didn't get a good enough signal. I didn't get a good. I'll show you. I'll show you like I did, but it's not. Well, the guy that told me that's your other buddy that, uh, that does this, you know, on the lake. He said there's a, you know, you have to be careful because there's a ten foot or so difference, even though you think there might be in the hummingbird. He doesn't know Lawrence as well, and I know without it, there's I'm right on my line. And the, this is how I how I know for certain. This is my confirmation. I run a lot of roads. Yeah. I run a lot of these dirt roads. They're not in concrete roads. It's just been clear cut across, and I've got no play. I've got no room. It's a one lane dirt road, and I run it. And I can see the tree lines or whatever. And uh, again, you will have the grades if you do not boot it up and let. Go, there's a there's just like I showed you on a lot of other screens that aren't being used. My I think I passed it around. The whole theory of the variance was the satellites that they're just not mm -hmm. that accurate unless they're government satellites or they're government you know equipment. Oh, no, government I, equipment ain't that accurate either. Well, I, I, I haven't I haven't seen any of that. I, I would I would not agree with that, or I would yeah. do what I do. If you I would rank already. If you get twelve satellites, your, your resolution is down. That's the key. Down, down to the point where you. you have, should have an indication on your. You can. You go to satellite signal and it'll tell you, it'll show you how many you have. But it'll also if that was the case, I would already be wrecked. And I've never hit a deal. Well, the first year I was here, I took off and hit something. I've never bumped or hit a single stuff. And I run some stuff that even some, some of the old schoolers that lived here 30 years said, What the? What are you thinking? And I said, Well, I've got gear that you don't know how to use. You should, you should have an indication on there of your estimated... Uh, Absolutely. Your, your you can go in there, and there's some variation, too, that there's a little bit of tweaking that may be done. You can, you can 
adjust some of that minor, but mainly I just make sure every day that I have at least nine satellites of the 12. That seems to me we're a solid, and I don't worry about any of the shrubs. I do watch out for a lot of lay downs and they trees fall down, so I don't worry about what's in that anymore. All right, no problem. no problem. All right, thank you so very much. It's Michael McFarland. Remember, if you have sonar trouble, if you want to get your sonar set up, you want to go on the water with me in your boat or my boat, you learn about it. I'm now open for that, and it's um, it's it's going to be very economical for you. So I appreciate your time. McFarlandFishing.com. Check us out. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, man. Thank you. Well, Mr. Justin, you do, you do. Well, the content of That's about my pay grade right there. <laughs> it took me a long time to get that. A long time. Uh, you can ask Kevin Sharp. I, I sissied around this lake for quite a while. And um, Kevin, did I not hop in your boat the other day and didn't even have that? What did I do? What did I do? I went, it's some crazy stuff, huh, son? <laughs> I'm sure Mike was, or, or I'm sure uh, that they were, they were probably thinking twice about it. All right. Fall transition, I don't remember who exactly was. Somebody asked for us to discuss fall transition. It's really, really exciting time of year. I mean, I know I'm sitting here calm before you, but I promise you every morning that I wake up right now, I start to get a little bit of a shake going because when is it going to be the day? It's coming. And it's already started. We've had some signs of it already at the migration beginning. It is without a doubt the biggest home run time of year. The schools of fish get bigger this time of year than they do any other time. Uh, there are larger schools of bass than you'll find the rest of the year. And it happens every year like clockwork. Now, some years weather depending, lake conditions depending, all the variables that we have to take in on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, those fish can sometimes really migrate up through the shallow waters. And sometimes on Lake Fork, especially with all the structure we have available to them, they stay out offshore and they just set up in mega schools offshore. Uh, more of that happened last year. If y'all remember, last year we were a little bit low. The water was a little bit low in the fall. Uh, didn't have as much good depth on our grasses as we do some other years. And last year, the fish kind of stayed out deep. This year, we've already got fish shallow. We had fish shallow that were resident fish throughout the summer. Uh, good sized fish, bigger fish than what people think would be there. Um, and we've already seen signs of those fish starting to migrate up the major creek arms. They're using these stop signs on the way in. And we'll talk about what stop signs are here in a minute, but uh, we've already seen those bigger than average fish start to pull into these creeks and pull up on these stop signs as they're making their way to the back. So when that's happening the first week of September, hey, it's going to be a good fall. It's going to be a fun fall. You know, a lot of different ways to catch them. Uh, that's the biggest thing about fall that I want you guys to understand is it is not about what bait you're throwing. There are some general patterns that work better than others and this, that, and the other, but there is two dozen different ways to catch them on any given day in the fall. Uh, they are there to eat, so they will bite. You can fish fast, you can fish slow. There's a lot of different ways to go about it. The biggest thing about fall is moving. They're moving, so you need to be moving. You have to find them. And the earlier you find them as they start making their way in, the better you can stay with them. And that's what we're going to kind of focus on today. Big dummy. Hey, Farmer, I'll tell you what, man. He's somewhere else. I'm right here. Took my cup from me. Don't. <laughs> I'll let you have mine. Yeah. I didn't want to walk in front of you. So, all right, stop signs. What are stop signs, right? Stop signs, you guys watched the video on Wednesday. I talked about this at pretty good length. Stop signs. For me in the fall, primarily are secondary points inside the creeks and the channel swings that go up against the bank inside the creek are the main two stop signs that I focus on when I'm talking about shallow water fishing in the fall. This year, I think the shallow water fishing, this fall, I think the shallow water fishing will be a phenomenal fall period like it was two years ago, year before last, um, because the lake's full. We have grass going out in deeper water. We have some grass going out seven, eight miles of the water in some places. Uh, I think those, we've already seen the signs of those, those bait fish as they migrate into these creeks are using those grass lines as their migration routes versus using an offshore channel, uh, which they tend to do when the water's lower like last year. They used the deep creek channels and such as that. Now they're using those grass lines as their migration routes. So, drew up a little bit of a diagram here. 
some of my fine artwork. I will autograph this and auction it off later tonight. <laughs> it's upside down. <laughs> it's actually not. <laughs> <laughs> but this is like a bunch of squiggly lines is all it is. But if you look at the outside perimeter, okay, so I tried to give you a rough drawing of just could be any creek arm. Hey, I know where that spot is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Could be any creek arm, just different pockets, and that's how the creeks are on Lake Fork. We have a lot of elevation change, so we get a lot of little kickoff coves and corners and nooks and, you know, side creeks into the main creek. All that kind of stuff happens on Lake Fork. There's some big ones back there. Yeah. So... When I say creek channel swings and secondary points, what am I talking about? Every one of these points that you see on this map would be what I consider to be a secondary point. It's inside the creek. It's not pointing at the main lake. It's pointing at the creek, right? That's what I consider a secondary point. We're talking about points inside creeks. So as you progress up here, there's a couple different things to look for. There's a couple different types of points. I've tried to draw three different point-driven scenarios that I look for. The first one, which is often the one that you'll find them earliest on, is not so much of what you think of traditionally as a point that jets way out. It's more of a ledge that just kind of runs the rim of the point, right? So that point is kind of flat, just a, a long, slow, sloping. It can even be a, a flat piece of bank sometimes. It'll just have a ledge that runs out and then a shelf. Well, those fish will use that shelf to travel, and then when they want to feed or when they want to stop, they'll pull up on the flat just sets up a dinner table. You'll see a lot of this. Anywhere where those bait fish, what'll happen is those bait fish, they're moving through these avenues when you have an elevation change, a sudden elevation change. Well, we all know about pinch points, like bridges. We all fish bridges a lot, right? On whatever lake we go to because they pinch point. They concentrate all the life into one little area. Well, these elevation changes that come out into the lake do a similar thing, but instead of pinching it this way, they pinch it this way. So as they come up on that ledge, they're traveling, they want to stop, they pull up on that ledge, well those bait fish get condensed. So the bass, that's just, you know, ding, 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 dinner bell time for them, right? So that's the first one I look for, is just those straight shelves or ledges that kind of run down your rounder point or your flat banks. Uh, the second one is, you'll have some of these round points like this, right? And this is very similar to the creek channel, and you'll, you'll see the similarities when I talk about creek channels here in a minute. But you'll have these points that have kind of this round flatness to them, but on the sides, they'll slope. If you look at the contour lines there, how they spread out coming out on the point, but on the side, all the contour lines run in together. On the sides of these round points, what I call them, I call them round points, they'll have that ledge. Again, same thing, as those fish travel through that grass line and down that bank line, that's going to concentrate those fish from top to bottom in a tighter area. And that's what we're looking for, guys. That's the stop sign. Here you have a traditional point that sticks out that we all think of as a point where it's got a ridge line that runs way out there. Same thing, and I'm going to tell you, you can catch a mega school of bass on this in the fall, but that window is smaller. They will use this more and longer on these two than they will that narrow ridge that runs out there. Now, creek channel swings. You guys can see where like this the creek channel is kind of running through the middle here. See where it swings up right there, swings up over here, swings up over here. It over there has a little bank that it runs up on. In all these scenarios, you know, when I was first told about fishing the creek channel swings, boy, I'd go looking for those creek channel swings that had that big drop, and I'd find them, and I'd sit there and I'd flip into that creek channel, let it fall down that ledge, and I wouldn't catch nothing. I'm going, man, these guys are catching a lot of creek channel swings, and I can't catch nothing. For me, what I have found is with the exception of the middle of summer and the middle of winter, creek channel swings will be a frequent stop sign for fish, especially in the fall, but when they're wanting to eat, they will use the top side, just like they do on these points. So if you look at what that creek channel does right there, when it swings up there, and it's got that good hard edge on that creek channel, it's got a good drop on it, good elevation change, that's gonna create the same thing here as you have here on both sides, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So when I go into this creek channel, I'm not actually, I say I'm fishing the creek channel then. I'm actually not. I'm fishing the high spots adjacent to the creek channel then. Okay, so if they're using this creek channel to migrate and they're coming up here, well, when it's time to 
pull up and feed somewhere, that's where they're going to go to that high spot right there. And right up next to the bank, where the creek channel swings up next to the bank, it's going to create the highest high spot throughout that stretch. Everybody tracking? Boat position, when you're pulling up on something like that, do you set your boat in the, in the deepest part and cast up? Yeah. Or do you approach it from the side? For me, the way I start every time, the way that I found is typically the most successful is to have my boat in the deeper water, throwing up the shallow, dragging it back to deep. Because those fish, as they're using these avenues to travel, those bait fish will get stacked up on top, and those bass will, as they pull up there, they're going to be on the edges waiting to ambush stuff. And there are times, though, in the fall especially, when they get, when those bass get right up on top of it, hey, at that point, I'll tell you, boat position doesn't matter, because when they're all up here, you can catch them. I mean, you can throw a naked hook out there just about and catch them at that time, because that's that fall schooling frenzy that we all look for. Uh, the, so that's your creek channel swings, that's your points, that's kind of all the areas. Grass that correlates with this, on Lake Fork in particular, grass that correlates with this stuff will be a big deal this year. Okay? But moreover, no matter what lake you're at, this migration will happen, and these stop signs, where the creek channel swings right up next to the bank, creates a hot spot, these points that run out create those hot spots. Those uh -huh. funneling points that condense the water column from top to bottom, they will use that when the feeding plateaus on every lake across the country. It doesn't matter where you go. What kind of average depth are you talking about? Are you going, are you throwing it way up into the, into the you know, number. Foot, a foot deep and bring it back? Or what's and so, I, I know the lake levels change. Right, <laughs> and that's going to change as water temperature changes. That's going to change throughout the season. Uh, the other part about fall, guys, is this right here. I mean, what are you doing? Hey, Only cat that'll fit. <coughs> Only cat that I know that'll fit right there. Um, <laughs> but movement, guys, what we said in the beginning, hey, when they move, you move. And that's what's going on here. So even as far as the depth ranges go, somebody like this shelf right here, let's say that shelf's in six foot of water. And so earlier on this time of year, I'm catching them in six foot of water. There's some grass scattered across that shelf. And they pulled into that first spot in the creek on that shelf. That's what they're using. And I'm catching them. Well, as the fall moves on, you know, right now the water's hovering around the 80 degree mark, so it gets down to the 70 degree mark. Hey, they might move up on top of this point, way up here in two foot of water around 70 degrees. So it's always changing, it's always moving, and that's the hardest part about fall is moving around enough and exploring enough to find those fish. But once you find them, if you can kind of stay with them as they move, you can really catch them. I mean, the best fishing of the year hands down can happen in the fall if you hit it right um, and that's the big deal when they start here and you catch them here this week hey next week when you come out start right there if they're not there move to here if they're not there move to here if they're not there and you just have to move until you cross paths here's the beautiful part about it in the fall it's not like in the summer you know we have to change our mindsets we've been in the summertime time of year where you may sit on the spot for two hours because you know there's fish there and they're not going anywhere. That's where they are. That's where they've been all summer. And you sit there and you make the same cast over and over and over again. Get that out of your heads. These fish have already started moving. And this time of year, you make a few casts and you move. You make a few casts and you move. The other day when I was fishing some cooler water temps with some customers, I would venture to bet we fished 20 plus locations. That's how many times we put the trolling motor in the rack and ran. It was at least 20 different times throughout the day. Uh, probably more than that, really. Because you make a few casts, if they don't bite, go. I mean, that's how it is in the fall. You just click along. And when you find them, they will bite. They're there to eat. Yep, I'm not forgetting stuff like I usually do. A um, couple things on baits. Uh, crank baits of all sorts. You know, as we get into the fall, it's so bait fish related that I become a big fan of crank baits because they can cover a lot of water, and that's what we're talking about, covering a lot of water fast, moving. you got to do all these different things, hit all these different points. Well, there's not much better than having a few different depth crankbaits tied on, and you can hit all of it, right? Uh, something simple and easy. Everybody can catch them on a crankbait when they bite it. You know, you just kind of reel them in. You don't, you don't have to set the hook. You don't have to work the bait. Uh, so for that reason, I love a crankbait in the fall. The other factor is the big baits. Big swim baits here. You know, the next cold front or two, next, the next like real hard cold front we have, the big swim bait might be starting to go. And, you know, that's not a deal that's for everybody. Uh, that's not a deal that you're going to catch numbers on typically. But in the fall, 
one time a year that's kind of that exception where you can catch a lot of fish on big baits because it's no different than anything else. It's a little bit harder to find that school of giants, but it's just like all these other fish. When you find that school, they're there to eat, and if you find the one that wants to eat that big bait, hope you're not that good because <laughs> it's going to get crazy. So basically what it boils down to is I'm not giving you any information. I'm telling you, get into a creek, move around a bunch, and throw something that looks like a, shit, a bait fish. Right? <laughs> but those stop signs, though, finding those high percentage areas, look for that. Where that water condenses, and anywhere that you have that and they have some good grass or some type of good cover, brush pile, whatever, those are going to be your high percentage areas. Yes, sir? If you say you get out there and you get that all figured out, you found a nice deal, and just like you said, can that be expanded? Can you possibly replicate that around? Oh, the absolutely. Place? Absolutely, yeah. So thank you for that. That's a very good question. Um, once you find a pattern in the fall, for that given day at least, unless you've got some type of weather system moving through, for that day you should be able to run that pattern in everywhere that sets up the same. So if you catch them on the second point back in the creek, you know, second secondary point into a creek mouth, that's where you caught them, you should be able to go to the next creek and the next creek and the next creek all day long, unless you have some weather changes. So you're, let's just say for the sake of argument, you're up there in the birch, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what creek that is. <laughs> it's okay. a very terrible drawing, but that's what creek that is. I recognize that. Yeah, bank absolutely. Right there. absolutely. But, okay, let's say you're up in the area, and then you, and, and like for me, for instance, I don't know, I've never been past the top 14 bridge mm -hmm. up there. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the extent of that creek is right there to that bridge. Okay. But let's say I went up in White Oak. I mean, is that just exclusive to the main arms of the lake, or like he was saying, could it be done in White Oak? Yes. Could it be done in Wolf? White Oak is a creek. It's a different creek because it's a real broad bay okay. type of shape. I, I didn't, I, I've never been in it. I just know yeah. it. I've seen it on the map. So, like, White Oak's a big, wide, broad bay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the creeks come in different shapes and sizes, for sure, on Lake Fork. I mean, we've got, like I said, the elevation changes really create a lot of neat contours in this lake, and they really create a lot of different varieties of you know, shapes of creek, types of creek. But... The bottom line is on Fork we have such a population of bass mm -hmm. that there's going to be some fish migrating through every one of them when they do the mass migration like they're getting ready to do. Is it going to be a different time frame? That, is it, say, if that's a deeper, broader cove, is it, um, is it going to be like the, you know, like the spawn goes and right. starts in the north and da 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 So what you'll find is in the fall because of, what, and we, re we really didn't have much of a turnover this year, it was a little bit of one, not much of one at all really, but what you'll find is in the fall because we have the turnover situation where the water does churn and mix that the water temperature will get similar from top to bottom and from north end to south end of the lake, that there won't be, especially on that initial migration in, there won't be as much of a variance as far as the north end of the lake to the south end of the lake because it's all pretty much the same temperature. And ultimately, guys, the only thing that's going to cue those fish to move is water temp and length of day. That's the two things that matter as far as moving those fish into a fall migration pattern. And that's not going to change. If your water temp's the same throughout the lake, your day period is obviously the same throughout the lake. So those fish are going to move at the same time all across the lake. So yes, you can. So if you're catching them on, you know, one of the points going into the mouth of birds, you, you're pulling up there and catch them, you should be able to pull them to the points at the mouth of white if you catch them this way. What's up, man? Theoretically. No, they won't, they won't be I on every single point. Can I get that right here? Yeah. They won't be, <laughs> <laughs> they won't be on every single point, right. but if you run enough of them, you'll find those. And like I said, in the fall, that's what it's all about. You're moving a bunch because these fish are moving in big schools. When they move in big schools, I mean, there's a lot of areas that don't have anything. The more big schools there are, the more empty water there is, too. That's what the deal about fall is. You can go for hours, and then 30 minutes, and you'll never forget it. Yeah. Okay. You look for them on electronics before you fish a point that area? If they were doing the deeper deal, so like last year, yes, the fall deal was 100% driven by electronics. Well, I mean, we wouldn't even fish unless we saw what we were looking for. Um, never fish the spot unless we saw it. In fact, there'd be times in the day when we'd pull up on the spot and they were moving around like they do in the fall. There'd be times in the day where we hit you know, a certain offshore structure three or four times in the day and not fish it. And then the last time we went in there, they're there and we, we fish it. Um, but this type of deal, because of they're using these grass lines and they're kind of moving up a little bit more shallower this year. Electronics aren't as much of a factor as far as actually seeing the fish. In the electronics are a factor in the way of your mapping on your depth changes, your stop signs, and uh, your water temp, stuff like that. Yes, sir? 
I feel silly asking this question. Okay. You mentioned it several times on the video. Yes, sir. I watched it and it was through that. And on the video, you mentioned a lot of times the start and the mouth of the creek. That's right. Where is the mouth? Where is the mouth? I mean, okay. Running Creek goes all the way to 515. So East. to me, <laughs> kind of the mouth of Running Creek mm -hmm. is where it starts to condense north of 515 East, right? So where that, man, which that's actually kind of, you know, Big Caney, Running, Coffee, it's all of them. Yeah, they all count. But to me, kind of as far as the migration patterns go, uh, once you get past Glade, I would consider that Running Creek. And there are fish that live on that <coughs> structure around that bridge and just south of that bridge that are, some of those fish are going to migrate all the way up Running Creek. Yeah. And some of those fish are going to break off and migrate in the Glade, and some of them are going to right. migrate yeah. in the Bell. But yeah, well, I was trying to figure out where do I start. So, and using Running as, a, as an example. That's a good one. That's one I'm using right now. I'm actually fishing uh, stop signs along the banks of Running Creek as soon as you get north of the lake because they're early in the progression. So I'm actually hitting some of those pockets and points and the little secondary point, the little nooks and crannies that, that are shaped in there in Running Creek or Coffee, whatever you where the main east arm just north of where Glade breaks off. Um, moreover, birch, I think everybody knows birch, right? So where you would start looking in there is honestly right around duck call, you know, on both sides and just start hitting all those spots, going in one side and coming out the other until you find the school. And then once you find the school, hey, here's the beautiful thing is once you find the school, you just follow the weather patterns, and that's going to dictate which way those fish move. Which is so, staying close to the creeks. Well, no, no, not not the main creeks. So, like the main creeks, I'm out in the middle of birch. No, not necessarily. Like I'm hitting points and little ledges coming off banks and stuff even like the that. Creeks away. Even though the creeks out in the middle, I'm because, like I said, what they're doing this year because we've had an early cool down and we have so much grass, they're using these shallower contours to migrate instead of migrating out in that creek. Yes, sir. Any other questions? No other questions. Hey, those little uh, square pieces of paper, hold on to them, okay? Till the end. You know, win, have a chance to win something. Whoa. <laughs> I didn't get one. I'm not going to be a much. Oh, you got any light? I got to make you one. It's not going to be a too much value, but it's going to be something. All right. Justin, are you ready, sir? Yep. Yes, sir. Come on. Y'all remember Justin Crawford? Been so long since he's been here, I don't know. Oh, Justin. Y'all know Justin? Yeah, a little bit, huh? <laughs> We're starting to run out of chairs. Uh, Justin is just an awesome guy. One of my best friends. He's just one of the best people I know. He's pretty dang good at fishing. He's been known to catch it. He still, he still has the biggest fish I know of this year. If anybody don't know, you caught the biggest fish. How big was it? 12 what? 12 2. 12 2. It was a fork, but it, it was. was. It was a falcon. He was doing some guy trips on falcon, but yeah, 12 2. So it's a beast. He's got some game. Uh, he's going to talk to y'all about I don't know what probably we'll carrot patterns. So, yep, yeah, he's the man. Y'all give him a hard time. How are you guys doing? I appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, it's pretty hard to follow these guys up. I'll put them butcher this. Uh, I'm going to use your drawing. Too. Well, I talk about how bad my drawings are. Then somebody else always uses my drawings. You have copyrights on there? Absolutely. It's kind of all like graphic sellers, aren't you? They've talked a lot about the fall transition and what the fish are doing, and uh, it's been pretty much the same for me. I see that my <coughs> summer pattern is starting to fall apart as far as me fishing my deeper brush piles and the uh, deeper timber and stumps. They're moving. My best bite is in the 12 to 15 foot range right now, and I'm uh, I'm actually covering a lot of these stop signs like Billy's talking about in the 12 to 15 foot range on these points is what I'm focusing on most of the part of my day. But in the morning times where these river channel swings come real close to the bank, I have about three or four spots that I'm fishing that it'll, it, from the bank to that wall, it drops off a good 18 foot. And there's a lot of grass real close to the, the banks that I'm fishing. And I'm focusing on that in the mornings and the evenings. And I'll fish it from sun up till, depending on the cloud cover on the day, 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And, uh, when I'm fishing there, what I'm doing, I'm running and I'm looking with my eyes because like Billy was saying, with the grass being so thick, it's hard to really see your bait and your fish in that grass. 
So I'll pay attention and I'll look for bluegill or bigger gizzard shad or even the small thread fin. And when I start seeing a lot of that bait, it's when I'll slow down. And we're punching big Texas rigs whenever we find that area that the bait are holding. And it may take running 100, 200 yards up and down the bank to really find where those that bait's wadded up in that grass. In, in the morning times, now that we're starting to have these cooler trends, they're really getting up in the shallow grass and feeding real hard till the sun comes out. But my main go-to, as soon as that sun comes up for pretty much the rest of the day, is running, and I may have run eight to, to 12 to 15 times a day, just covering a lot of ground to find these fish that are pulling up in the schools. And I'm focusing on these secondary point stop signs, and I look for isolated cover on these 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 points with my graph and what I'm looking for is underwater stumps you know and the, the bigger the better the, the bigger around the, the stump and the taller it is in the water the better and uh, I'm throwing my Alabama rigs around it and it's yeah it's uh it can be interesting getting those hung up and you know over and over and over because it adds up but it's really been paying off to find those schools the ones that are fired up feeding and when you get on I mean you can double and triple up on one cast you know and catch Six to twelve fish in that one school. The Alabama River, I feel like, gets them fired up more than any other bait I've had to throw. <laughs> Home run time. It is. It'll wear you out. It really will. But I, I love that bait. Um, I'll sit. I'll, I'll really work these these spots and run my eight to twelve, maybe fifteen different locations throughout the day. And um, it'll take me. I may take. Just depending on the spot, I may focus on it for twenty minutes, or I may fish it for up to an hour just depending on how much activity that I see going on around me. If I get there and I'm not seeing any bait fish on my screen, and I'm not seeing really a whole lot of top water activity or anything going on, then I may stay 20, 25 minutes. But if I get there and I start seeing a lot of activity on top water and I see wads of bait all around it, I know to really focus on staying on that isolated timber. Because I feel like when they're moving in, these stop signs, they're sitting on this wood during the day and they're only feeding throughout the day when that bait comes in. Until that bait comes in, they're going to hold on that log. And I tell my customers to throw the Alabama rig as close to the log as they can. And you will get hung up. And the lure retriever, you know, sometimes get it off, sometimes won't. Uh, a better way to do it, you know, you can't run jigs, a swim jig. A uh, weedless swim jig won't get hung up as much, but I feel like it doesn't get them fired up near as much as that Alabama rig. And I'm, I'm running it uh, five bait out of memory. And I love Picasso. That's my favorite brand. I've done a whole lot of I really run out of memory a whole lot in the wintertime on uh, Monticello. That's where I've learned my lesson. Of after catching two or three fish on those cheaper young ones, the arms will break off and you're going to be heartbreaking. You'll have a four or five pound and you try to get her to the net, you'll see it break off and she swims off the arm in the mouth. And I feel like the Picasso has the re a really good, strong arm on it. I can catch six, seven, eight fish before I know that it's you know, starting to weaken it out on me. And the big ticket for me is when you buy these, it comes with a, uh, a swivel on here that has you know, an opening that you can put the hook on. I always take that off and replace it with the split, or just a split ring. And what that does is that, that keeps it, every time you cast that bait with that longer link down there, it feels like it's always getting wrapped up on your A-rig. And have, putting that split ring on there, it keeps it from getting wrapped up on your arm near as much. And what I'm throwing as far as my line on my A-rigs is 25 to 30 pounds monofilament. And the reason why I'm throwing monofilament is because when you, you know, you get it, and my customers, especially, they start catching a lot of fish, you start getting excited, and you'll start wanting to overheave this bait. And as big and heavy as this thing is, if you throw it too hard, it just unspools that line 100 miles an hour, and then in midair, it'll catch. And if you had regular fluoro and even 40, oh, uh, 40, 40, 50 pound uh, <laughs> braid, it'll snap it in midair. And I've seen with that mono fellow that when that happens to my customers, that mono has enough stretch in it to yank it back towards them without you know seeing a thirty forty dollar bait something flying through the air in the middle of the water, and um, I like to use on my swim baits. Um, Kitek is a really good brand. These aren't Kitek. This is Reac Reaction Innovation. My favorite is a Kitek. They're a little bit more expensive, but you can't beat the action of the uh, the tail on the Kitek. 
In the fall, it doesn't really matter because you're not having to slow roll it as much. It's more of a, a pretty steady retrieve, depending on how far down your log and your, your structure is you're fishing. And, oh, man, uh, but in the wintertime, whenever you're using this and you put those those Kitex on there and you're fishing deep, deep water and slow rolling it, I mean, you can, I mean, pulling as slow as you possibly can, those Kitex tails, they still are kicking pretty good with a real slow retrieve. And then um, there's another pattern that I'm running. Whenever I get up into six to eight foot in the evening times when the sun starts going down, I'm running these same types of areas. And honestly, the, if you can find a stop sign with, with um, a point that comes out, a secondary point that comes out with a river channel that swings either inside that cut or on the outside of it, that's been my really my, my best, best go-to. And I'm running a scoundrel head and if you can find that depth of 8 to 10 foot where that river channel will swing on those points where you see some standing timber, I think I'm saying it right. Is it scrounger head? Scrounger head. I'm running a scrounger head with the... Uh, it's just a funky chatterbait, basically. Yeah. With the Lake Fork Magic Shad in just a watermelon color. And I'm not even dipping my tail, which is surprising. I live on that garlic spike it, but I haven't been using it. But when I, when I get into that six to eight foot area, or maybe even a little bit shallower, I'm having my customers throw this as close to the wood as they possibly can and pull it back fast enough to where the head's wobbling. You know, I tell them not too slow because if it's too slow, it's, it's acting all weird. You want it just fast enough, and it's just like a chatterbait, and this whole thing will wiggle and gives it a lot of good action. And come November, this is about the only bait that I'll throw. Almost all of November, whenever they really pull up shallow and they're, you know, in the backs of creeks and all along real, real shallow timber, this is my go-to bait. And it's been already been working, but uh, like I said, my best bite's been in that 12 to 15 foot area on the Alabama rig. And the crankbait will work as well. Just, I feel like it doesn't get those schools fired up as fast as that A-rig does. Do you change your colors during the day? Uh, no, sir. I've been using just uh, the watermelon all throughout the day. Um, whenever I'm punching that grass, I'm using the Okeechobee crawl uh, and the hyperworm. And that's been a really good bite the last two or three days for me since that cold front blew in. The east wind didn't help out yesterday, but um, like I said, first thing in the morning, that's where I'm going to is that grass, that thicker hydrilla. And I'm putting a real heavy one ounce to one and a half ounce weight with a four aught hook and just flipping that hyperworm through there and just have it. And in some of the thicker spots, you have to, I mean, you got to kind of toss it up, you know, pretty pretty good in order to punch through that. Just how to do that again? Grass. No, I'm not going to break the <laughs> I can't afford it. What size scrouncher do you use? Um, I'm using the uh, quarter ounce scrouncher head. I feel weird every time I say it. Scrounger head? Yeah, I feel like I'm saying it wrong. Scroll under? Scrounger, scrounger, scrounger. Also, another key to my Alabama rigs is I'm a big believer in the white blades. Some people can't stand white, whatever. I don't like the gold and the silver. I really like the gold and silver on Monticello, but on fork, I like the either half white, half sartreuse, all white, or sartreuse blades. I don't like Pain the gold blades. and silver, the real flashy stuff. It just looks a little bit more natural. You change those out yourself, or do you already get them that way? Uh, no, sir. Picasso makes them that way. On the A rigs, is there any restriction on the tournaments in Texas? Not in the state of Texas. You can well, have, you can have any number. The big trails, huh? but the big trails, but the stuff that we fish bass champs, I don't know of any. For McDonald's. Or yeah, no, there isn't. McDonald's. I don't know of any restriction on that. There isn't. Only elite. And sure. In certain states, I think you only have three hooks. You have to cut the rest of them and make them dummies. But in Texas, yeah. I have some A rigs that are. It's it's called the Picasso makes it the bait ball extreme bait ball extreme and it's got fifty something deals yeah it's got like twenty five <laughs> dummy swim baits that are like that big and it's got eleven with hooks coming off the back of it I mean, it's, it's like it's like throwing a brick yeah, it's pretty retarded though it is it's crazy it's, it's too much it's crazy it's too you guys have any questions at all I mean, somebody tell you to put it on heavy braids so you wouldn't break it off <laughs> yes sir I don't know I'm guessing if you're not gonna catch it the heavy braids okay. Um, on, on Monticello, I do use 65 pound braid with my A rigs, and you can't snap it even when it gets hung up in the midair. But on fork, that's a good question. I don't use braid on fork because it's not the sight of the, the line. You know, it's a reaction base. They're really looking at that ball. 
But if you're underwater and you hear that braid coming mm-hmm. through the first eye of that rod, it's, it's, I mean, the vibration, the sound that it puts off, especially that thick 65 pound braid, I feel like they keyed in on it, you know, the, the trained fork bass. Mm-hmm. Mike, come on back up, man. You can take your front tip off and put a titanium tip on it. Stop doing that. All right. Well, here, let's uh, shift over a little bit. Come on, Mike. There we go. All right. Is there any more uh, general questions? Anything y'all want to up? Open for them. No? What did the moon do the other night for you guys? Did you guys go out or you guys even go out that evening? I caught the fish. It was just pretty good. <laughs> and it's affected, it's, like this, it affected the daytime fishing, honestly. Tuesday and Wednesday affected uh, the crappie fishing during the day. Tell you what, I'm glad you asked that. The next seminar two weeks, for me, if everybody's cool with this, will be about what the moon does to the moon fish. Moon effects, moon. what it does, what to expect from the moon. Okay? Very good. Sound good? That would be a good one. Because I think we all know what it does in the spring. We know that they travel on it in the spring, but even for me, I mean, I, I understand somewhat of what happens, but... It does a lot. It's kind of a mystery for me, too. I just know there's peak hours and not so. I know when it's over my head or under my foot is the best time of day. And that's really about the extent of my knowledge on the moon. There's a lot, especially hunters and stuff. Yeah. Cattle, everything is yeah. really related. Squirrels will move and stuff like that. And there's also, we'll talk about the seminar, but there's also some things that affect it. So very cool. Cold fruit. Very cool. Yeah, good. Any other questions? Well, guys, as we get into fall, I mean, hey, it is a time of year that it's not simple because they move so much and it can change so fast. But I'm telling you, it's exciting. If you think about every bait that was mentioned here tonight, uh, Justin's talking about some current stuff, so he's got that flipping deal. But other than that, every bait that was mentioned tonight is something, it's a moving bait. It's a bait fish looking type of deal, right? And, and it's covering water. And, and that's really the biggest thing. Yes, sir. If you take four seasons, you know, autumn, spring, winter, summer, and you take it and you divide them into two, like as far as travel. Oh, uh, yeah. That's actually very good. I'm glad you asked because I didn't yeah. talk about that whenever I was talking about the migration. We talked about the initial migration going in. For me, the migration coming out tends to happen somewhere around the 60 degree mark. They start, when the water gets down to the lower end of the 60s and really starts breaking over in the 50s, those fish. A lot of them migrate back and migrate back out. Some of them will make winter homes in that grass, and some of them will leave um, just like they do in the summer. Some of them stay up shallow in the summer, but uh, that's kind of the breaking point. And the other thing is, like I talked about earlier, where the water temperature is kind of the same all over the lake right now. By the time we get into the exit uh, migration, the water temperature will not be the same. It will cool off faster in the shallower parts of the lake, and so those fish will leave earlier. And you can follow a similar migration to when they come in in the spring. You know, a similar thing at the end of fall, you know, right at the end of November, first couple weeks of December, that time frame, you can actually hit them on their way out up north and then progress down the lake, and they're doing the same thing over a month-long period or so. If I may add to that, it can also happen very fast. You can have a they big can. cold front that brings cold, cold water down the creek, and it just kicks them right out of there, just like that. Yeah. So the actual migration <clears throat> out can be very similar to in. Depends on what happens to winter. We have a long, you know, slow coming winter. They may be on their way out slow. So it, usually the exit is a lot faster than the going. Yeah. If, it, if, it, if that water tip is down around 62, 63, and then it all of a sudden drops down to 50 because of some mega hard front, and it stays yeah. in the lower end of the 50s, those fish are gone like that. Overnight. Uh, I will stay in most creeks until my, uh, like to 60, I, I agree, I mean, think about it. You start noticing move, moving out at 60, but I will stay in a creek until about 54. After 54, I'm pretty sure they're, they're out. Yeah, and guys, as we talk about these migrations, keep in mind, this is a fluid deal, these fish are moving, and, you know, like we had, it got cool a couple weeks ago, and we got the water in the upper 70s, and then it got like 100 degrees for three days in a row. Well, when that happens, these fish that moved in, they're going to suck back out, and they'll move back in. I call it the two-step. I mean, we've talked about yeah. it, and they, they will just choom, 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 choom. And the same thing on the way out. If they, you know, if the cold front hits them, they'll pull out. If it warms back up and it gets back up around 60, they'll go back in. So you have to be cognizant at all times, keep an open mind, be aware of your surroundings, aware of all the different factors, and just mainly move, throw something that looks like a bait fish, and when you get a bite, do not leave that area. <laughs> Because it's very rare in the fall to find one at a time. Animals know what's coming. 
So two or three days, they have some kind of connection to Mother Nature to God that we don't. When we were Indians, we used to know how we lived off the land. We were survivalists, so we were forced to learn and depend on the cues of Mother Nature. So the fish will usually have a cue, too, that, that they'll, they'll know two or three days. We were just talking about this. Sometimes they won't necessarily move. These fish could have known that we are going to only have a couple days of heat, so maybe they didn't back up. Like an example, we had some nice cool water that were in the shallows were biting, and then all of a sudden they buttered up on us. They just pull out we discussed they could have come back a little. They could have just hunkered down, knowing, hey, we're, just gonna, just gonna, we're not going to back all the way to the mouth because in a couple more days it's going to come back. That's a lot of travel. So there's an unknown level that, call it mysterious, all animals have some kind of cues, ducks know when to migrate, etc. Um, so there's a little bit of variance in what that fish will do. This is one way of my point. We talked about it's the what's trending, okay? Mm -hmm. So example, when we went fishing on, say, one day it was 78, and all of a sudden three days later it was 85. One guy would say, well, 85's not bad, but it's pretty bad if yesterday was 78. Yeah. Or in the wintertime, you're going to see a guy shows up the lake and says, hey, 56, I love 56. Well, if yesterday was 67, 56 ain't so good. Follow him? Yeah. So we talk about this in depth. The trend is more important than the raw temperature. That's right. Absolutely. What was it doing? What was happening? Right now, what's coming? right now we're looking for the cooling trends. When you're on the back side of a two or three day cooling trend, those fish are going to pop. Expect to be If you're on the no, uh, uh, If you're on a warming trend, you, know, you can expect it to probably be kind of tough. I got plenty. What do you want? Um, you know, you can maybe hit something because it's that time of year when the feedback's on. But in general, it's going to be tougher on a warming trend than a cooling trend. Just Kevin, was there any online cues? There was, but they're not working. The Wi-Fi is off. Oh, perfect. Just, just the opposite cues in winter. You know, you, you see those warm trends. You look for 45 trees. Just the Wi-Fi. I don't know what's going on. All right. Anything else? Any more questions? What you looking for, bud? He's got a little surprise. Right, I think he's got a little yeah, surprise for him here. <laughs> like I said, there ain't much value. Yeah, I thought he, he said there's no value in this, fellas. I thought he would give you guys like some lollipops or something. But I've been out with this man. There's some serious value in this. All right, so what we're going to give away now is there's some serious value out here. It's not going to be a guy trick. It's not going to be this hat. Hell no. Uh, Y'all think you can this hat? Boy, you get my dowel before you get this hat. Uh, I love my dowel. Uh, what, what I'm going to give away is a day fishing with me for free on a filming day. So I'm not going to be your guide. I'm not going to be babying you. I've got to pay attention to the camera. And I'm on, i got to catch fish because you only get one chance to get them on camera. So I will be fishing hard in front of you. But if you're interested in coming out from, with me for a day on a filming day, I'm fixing to draw a number. Here we've got that number. We've got that opportunity. Go ahead, Cheater. Cheater. Your number is 856. It ain't in there. 13. Who's got 13? 13? Nobody's got 13. I got 12. Is that close? Right here. There he is right there. That man. Yeah. I only made one for everybody in here. I knew somebody had it. I was in a hurry. I was in a hurry. I was in a hurry. I know, I yeah. that, I promise you. So, I'm just a man hey, for the job, too. It won't be, you know, I'm not going to quite be Listen. my normal guide self, but hey, we're going to okay. have a good time. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Just do what you got to do. I'll just watch. We'll have a good time. I'm, I'll, I'll learn everything I can. You are required to give me a hard time and talk a little yes. fast. So yes. That's a requirement. Yes. Okay? Yes. Other than that, hey, y'all ain't got nothing else for me. I got, I got some. Thanks. Yes, sir. If yeah. anybody wants to fish Lake Palestine tomorrow, they have a terminal there where they're taking the vets fishing. The entry fee is already paid. They had a last minute cancellation. They need a boater. Is that they what we're saying? They need a boater for tomorrow on that cost. They need a boater to take this. If y'all don't know about that, uh, I forget the name of that tournament, but the uh, Operation Comfort. Operation Comfort. So the Hookset Brothers or an organization, it's just a few guys, uh, veterans. They got 83 boats right now. Yeah, just veterans, and they put on a big tournament every year. And what they do throughout the year is get uh, guys that are having a hard time settling back in, coming, coming back home, and they take them fishing. Hey. I don't know how many of y'all know this, but I was in Iraq in 2006 and 2008. Uh, fishing changed my life. You understand? I would not be a normal, and I'm not that normal, but I wouldn't be as close to normal as I am if it wasn't for fishing. It means a lot. I'm telling you, it's an important thing. So if any of y'all can do that, please do. Anybody interested? I thought about calling me the way, whether we had anybody or not. Those guys, Adam and Troy, they're good guys. So. Not really. I need that. No. <clears throat> All right. Hey, that's it, guys. Thank y'all for coming. Appreciate it.
Thank you. You'd be ready to shake your hand. You're making a few one number. Yes, sir. <laughs>